This is Bonjour Hi, the Bonjour Hi edition. I'm Avi Feingold in Montreal, and I'm here in Montreal with Alana Zakon and David Sklar in Calgary. We are your Frozen Chosen. It's Purim this week, and boy, could we use a Purim around here. We will be speaking to Laura Lebo about how funny Canadian Jews really are, and to honor King Achashverosh, who ruled from Hodu until Kush, we convene a roundtable of Jews in the cannabis industry, a holy hotbox, if you must, to get deep into the weeds on all things Jewy and marijuana. Alana, David, it's Purim. That was the best introduction ever, just saying. <laughs> you were so excited. Come on. This is, it, the, the material lends itself to, to this kind How of discussion. How many hours did you spend trying to come up with all those puns? 20 minutes this morning. <laughs> come on. The, okay. Like, this is the nature of cannabis, is that there are just millions and millions of puns waiting to be, like, plucked up. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Have you guys had any... Uh, what's, what's been your most memorable poems of years most past? Most memorable? <sighs> David, do you want to go first? Form costumes, well, fun moments. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm trying to think. Like I, I, the only times I could remember really celebrating Purim a lot was in elementary school, where we would have these big events, and I think the older kids in our school would like put together some kind of activity and games for all of us, and we would have to like give our nickels and quarters and dimes to attend these things. That was. It's all downhill after that, basically. I was trying to remember because we we've been around since last Purim. So I have a story, but now I'm wondering if I already told it last year. Does um, the story of the cow costume ring any bells? No pun intended. Uh, no. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> so when I was in daycare, are we are we sacrificing the cows? Not quite. Um, when I was in daycare, um, my mom wanted to make me a costume and made me a papier mâché cow costume with udders and a bell around my neck, which she thought was the cutest thing ever. And the kids in class made so much fun of me all my friends were princesses and then i came in as a cow with udders made of papier mache and they were like we're gonna play princess so i went over to them and i was like can i be your cow and they were like no (laughs) so that was pretty traumatizing Uh, but to this day my mom's like but it was so cute you looked so cute so that's my best story so this this is what started started you all off to sort of say I don't feel like I belong Honestly, in the community probably. itself. It was the cow incident. It might have been that might have been the first incident. But I did have some a, a lot of fun costumes that were less traumatizing and embarrassing uh, over the years. My mom liked to make all of our costumes from scratch. Did you, did you uh, usually have handmade costumes or you went on a bot like we, Halloween style? There, I think that there weren't nearly as many viable costumes back mm. when I was a kid and I don't have like tons of memorable right uh costumes from years past as a kid mm-hmm. um i mean there was a there was a year my mom made uh, from scratch the the famous kohen gadol costume that my, my mom made for me did that. um like really like all the way through and nobody had yeah. done this before there was like a big deal. oh yeah we're gonna dress them up yeah and so there was that one but i think my memorable and and to be fair yeah i mean kids love it um my kids have been super excited for purim yeah what are they gonna the what are oh, they gonna do this year um, i think we costumes? have we have a princess leia who, you see, for her first form, instead of being a cow, because um, her name is Kinaret, um, we actually cut out uh, one of the extra jumbo size boxes of Special K, like with the armholes and like leg That's holes. And we cute, were like, actually. we made her into to, you know, to a Special K. Um, there was a year when she was a Kinaret challah, right? Those frozen challahs and whatever. Anyways, because, uh, yeah, because the year before, my wife was a baker with a bun in the oven. Um, <laughs> That's really funny. So, you know, mm. that was there. So, so we have a Princess Leia. We have a Dorothy. Um, oh, with classic. for which I made um, from scratch a pair of ruby slippers. Um, wow, some cool sneakers! They are pretty. You awesome. made it. I made some ruby slippers, um, and then we have um, we were gonna have a, a Mirabelle from from Encanto um, with for the youngest, and she was really excited. But we couldn't find the costume like shipped in time and whatever. Um, and then the, the bigger piece was that because I had this big brown oversized hoodie, and uh, they wanted me to dress up as Bruno. Uh, you know, by extension to this, you haven't watched Encanto. I haven't have you? seen it yet. Have I've seen, seen the trailer. Encanto I don't know the names Jesus? of the characters. <laughs> like, I'm getting these blank. <laughs> Abby, when you when when you said Mirabelle, I thought they were going as the now defunct airport in north of Montreal. As the, as the airport, I try to say, if you want, I can paint some black lines on you and put some little toy planes on. And she didn't even get it. And like adults think this is funny, but nope. Um, have you seen Have you seen Encanto, David? No, no, I haven't. Oh God, I thought I've heard were, it's really good. Yeah. No, no, it's on my radar. Okay, I just good. haven't had a chance. Yet. All right. Well, we'll leave the Encanto talk to another time. Um, so that's like, that's where the cost, but like this morning, like she was like, oh, okay, can you like, cause Vanahafa who, right? They're big in this like whole, like Purim is supposed to be topsy turvy and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she gets in the car. She's like, oh, are you going to talk about that? Like maybe for, for, 
on like the podcast today, instead of calling yourselves the frozen chosen, you should have it the reverse. And you should like call yourselves as like the melted last on the list. <laughs> the melted last on the list. Ah, I right. See. And like, that, that was like, I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I, I get this whole, like we are talking about humor and fun, but we whatever. Are. Um, all my memorable poems were really like as a college student, university and beyond. Mm. Um, you know, there was, we used to have these memorable Hillel poem parties, which right. were like, like open bar $20 and everybody crammed into a tiny like club and went nuts and had an insane amount of fun. Um, there was a memorable year where I dressed up as a goth. Oh, um, are there, photos? Out. there are photos. Um, we will, uh, maybe we'll share those another time. Uh, and, uh, a or friend this of mine, time. this is actually very appropriate to this week's uh, discussion. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who was in the band who, uh, shall not be named, um, but is a, uh, member of the community, uh, was in the band and, uh, nobody had told him that the plate of brownies that somebody had passed along to the band, um, were, um, spiked, were so spiked, to so to speak. And he, um, and he had been hungry cause he had been fasting all day because the fast of Esther is the day before <laughs> oh, and he ate the whole, like the whole tray or something like that. And then he says, they started playing and I've heard this story multiple times and I've told this so many times. It's such a, like, he says, and then I see you in the front of the stage and I, I know that you're Avi Feingold but I see you're dressed up and I'm like I think you're the devil and as soon as the set <laughs> is over you're gonna like eat my heart out right you're gonna like cut it out and eat it and like that's, that's horrifying <laughs> and he's like so we played the longest set of my life because I just kept wanting to play more songs because Avi Feingold was still dancing like crazy in the front of the stage <laughs> and I wasn't on the greatest trip ever um, so you know those were the kinds of poems that we, um, oh we used my. to have we used to have these pretty much uh, off the I, there were Purim costumes. I, I went, I used to go very heavy on the makeup. Like yeah. I had friends that were in the makeup industry and so they would dress me up and this is before things were um, acceptable. I do absolutely regret. I would never do this again. Um, I mean, there were things that were, that you, we don't do anymore. Like I dressed up as a geisha one year. Um, right. I, I made a very, very attractive geisha. Um, <laughs> again, we need pics, but at this um, <laughs> point, maybe you don't want to get canceled by the world. Yeah. And, you know, there was stuff like that. But um, like I said, I, I, I regret it. I, I openly regretted this happened 25 years ago when yeah. it was a lot more acceptable. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, it wasn't blackface. I don't know if that's well, like, I was gonna good, say that. like, I mean, good or not. <laughs> You weren't, you weren't pulling a Justin Trudeau. No, you know what? I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it was my best Purim itself. It was my most drunkenness Purim. It was in Jerusalem. I was living there at the time. And I went in Rome, right? You just drink to your heart's content. And I remember being plastered. I woke up the next day. I needed a full day to recover after the Purim events. Because they go hard and they go crazy in Jerusalem for this what holiday. What does it look like? Like what, what was the vibe? Everybody was out. Everyone was out, secular, Orthodox Jew, everybody was drinking, the streets were littered. It was it was such a fun, fun party. Like the whole city took part and in the revelry. It was it was a wonderful um twelve hours of inebriation. There you go. Okay, you guys ready for Goth Avi? Yes. Oh wow, you pulled that up. Yes. Whoa, that doesn't that looks very realistic. I'd buy that you are like a music artist or something. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. How old um, are you there? Uh, probably 21, 22. 21. Uh, for uh, those who can't there. see the picture, <laughs> Avi's making like a sultry, kind of like album cover goth face. Okay. And, and this is the one that will never get published, right? Right there. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Um, right. This is what happens when you're friends with drag queens. You get um, makeup like that. Yeah. Uh, that's all I can he see said. That. David, do you want to, you have a reaction? Um, no, it's a good, it's a good thing we our our listeners cannot see what what Avi is showing us right now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> On that note, um, Purim is upon us, uh, but Passover is uh, not too far behind. Alana, yeah. we have an event that we're doing together. We do have an event we're doing together, and I would love it if I, we could meet some of you, and you can also get something out of it too. We're doing a Passover boot camp, so on March twenty third, it's going to be an interactive. Uh, 90 minute session that Avi is going to host with the Moisha House that I'm living at in Toronto. And you can learn about how to host your own Seder. Um, what other things can you learn about? Well, it's going to be basically like how to. It's more of a Seder boot camp than a Passover boot camp in general, but it basically, like, if you've never led a Seder before, um, from the practical 
you know, cooking and preparing side to the how to, you know, pick a Haggadah that people will be comfortable with and how to pick parts of the Haggadah that you want to focus on and other ones that you may want to skim over um, and just really get into how um, a Seder gets planned and executed in a meaningful and pain-free, relatively pain-free way. Um, I've been doing these for years and I'm so excited to be doing this with Moshe House um, and uh, come learn how to lead a Seder. David, are you going to come? You should come. I'm going to try. I know that I, uh, I have a bit of work right before that I'm going to. I might make the, ah. the, ta- the tail end of it. So if I can come like right for Chagadia, I'll be happy. We're not doing the Seder. We're learning about it. You no. didn't hear anything that he just said, did you? I heard everything. And if you're learn- and if you're teaching a Seder, you have to teach Chagadia and the other songs at the end. I don't. It's not a singing Ooh. workshop, but we'll take in your notes for consideration. That's the most important part of the Seder. I agree, but that's irrelevant to this event. Anyhow, we will post Fine. a link in the show notes. Uh, maybe you'll meet David. Maybe you'll meet him for a few minutes. Maybe he'll be dressed as a goat. Who knows? <laughs> Do we have a papier-mâché goat that we can give for uh, David? Because <laughs> <laughs> then we will do that the Fad yeah, absolutely. Uh, go, go, goat. Here we go. For, for David and his uh, recreational therapy uh, clients. Uh, anyways, Passover boot camp. Yeah. I'm excited. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Atelier Lou Bijouterie in Montreal, Quebec. Atelier Lou specializes in watches and custom-designed jewelry along with a curated selection of designer jewelry. Visit us online or in person and Eric Goldberg will help make your jewelry dreams come true. Atelier Lou is offering a promo code for all Bonjour High listeners using BON18 at checkout for 10% off your order at atelierlou.com. Okay, listen, we all know Jews are funny. But are Canadian Jews funny? And are the only funny Canadian Jews the professionals, you know, like the comedians and the rabbis, right? We needed the answers to these burning questions and get a sense of what's funny these days. So we invited Laura Lebo on to discuss. But yeah, this is a, a very sad story. I am. Um, I wasn't given the tits of, of my people. You know, I wasn't given like this nice, you know, this nice big Jew tits. You guys know these big old big Jew tits? purely functional. You know those tits? Giant. Nothing sexual about them. Just meant to like feed a Polish village. Shtetl titties. You know these? I didn't, you know, my mom got them, my sister, my bubby, like everybody. Except me. I, it's because I, I didn't have a, a bat mitzvah. And so um, that punished me. For those of you that don't know, a bat mitzvah is a Jewish ceremony uh, where you become a woman in the eyes of God. Uh, and some of your uncles, and um, just some, just some, and I didn't have it, so, you know, when God was, like, going around doling out Jew tits to everybody, uh, he passed over my house, and uh, I got stuck with these little Hitler tits, and that is the story of Passover. Uh, Laura's a comedian and a host of several podcasts on the CJN network, including A Few of My Favorite Jews and Won't You Be My Rabbi, um, which uh, had as its guest one of my favorite Jews, um, my wife, Rachel Kohl, Rabbi Rachel Kohl Feingold. Laura, happy Purim and welcome to Bonjour Chai. Happy Purim and thank you for having me. I love that you included rabbis. You're like, but is it only the comedian? Well, comedi- duh, because the nobody thinks rabbis and are the funny. Rabbis? Well, I guess rabbis are professional Jews. Is that how you'd qualify them? Yeah, I just that's th- what I think of them. Yeah, but I was just saying that, like, I think that rabbis always think that they are funny, and they—I'll be the first one to admit, as a rabbi, they rarely are. Um, um, the the worst thing are the rabbis that actually try to do the stand-up bits for oh, like for like that's the worst. you know oh yeah I'm gonna do my five-minute bit this time I'm oh. gonna do it as a fundraiser at the annual oh. like gala or something. But you know what? That is so Jewish that like. If you have any access to a stage, a.k.a. a platform that's slightly higher than other people, you're going to make it count and you're going to try material. That's so true. I mean, that's why I started Bonjour Chai. <laughs> Needed an outlet. <laughs> Just as a way for you to try out your comedy routines. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
No? Well, then, you know what? I want to know. I want to launch right into it. And Laura, I want to know, you know, we always have this tradition, this Jewish stick shtick humor, you know, which has been here for so long. But does it still resonate today with contemporary audiences? Like, is Jewish, what does Jewish humor look like today? That is a great question. I mean, if Jewish humor is uh, what do Jewish comedians generally talk about and and what resonates with audiences, Jewish and otherwise, it's certainly lost some of its, um, like, truly old-school, Borschbell Jewish uh, vibe. Um, a lot of Jewish comics I know, they'll talk about, uh, they'll talk about being Jewish, they'll make Jewish jokes, but the style is a lot more, like, sort of subdued and alternative. Um, there are still a few great, great Jewish comics doing, like, real shticky stuff, but it doesn't feel, it feels a bit more like ironic or they're sort of like alluding to a past time as opposed to like coming by it really honestly and organically. Um, like they're making fun of their grandparents. Kind of, like they're making fun of their grandparents or like even if they're doing it earnestly, you're like, how, how could you possibly sound like that? Like what shtetl did you just travel from that you really like organically sound like that? I, I think it works, but it's, it's certainly rare. Mm -hmm. Who are some of your favorite local or Canadian Jewish comics? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I would say local slash from Canada, um, Sophie Buttle, Nick Nemeroff, um, Robbie Hoffman, I think is actually originally from the States and then came here and then went back. But uh, they're all one. very, lost another one. That's the thing. Uh, it's It's a bummer to be a comedian in Canada. Uh, that that is the Canadian uh, comedian ideal. Didn't Elon Gold get his big start at Just for Laughs? A lot, of, a lot of Jewish comedians get their start at Just for Laughs, no? In Montreal, yeah. like Elon Gold and all the other... Yeah, they yeah. get their start at Just for Laughs, but in a way where it's like, uh, once you get Just for Laughs, then you can move to the States, you know? Yeah. Are there famous non-Jews that do Jewish humor that you know of that's actually funny? Either Canadian or not? Ooh, are there non-Jews that do Jewish humor that is actually funny? I feel really uncomfortable when non-Jews do like Jewish jokes in their sets. I'm like, why are you? No, like this is not your property. Don't talk about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Sugar, Sugar Sammy does like stuff about the Jews in Montreal. And like, I think that he does it in a respectful, tasteful way because he has a lot of friends that are Jewish. What do you think, Laura? I mean, I'm uh, the first thing that popped into my head when you asked that is I know a comedian. She's really funny. I won't name her. Um, she had a Jewish boyfriend. He's alive. They just broke up. Um, and she did some jokes about him that were like just on the line. She's really funny. And so it it's funny worked. because to her family, to his family, she was dead right when they started dating. <laughs> <laughs> That's but they um, had a full she, shiva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's very I'll give funny. you one rabbi comedy point. <laughs> sure. Do you want to keep um, scoring yeah, go or on. should I? Um, um, I don't know. I'll I'll get out a whiteboard. Perfect. Okay, we got one. Um, yeah, it was it's it's a it's a good bit, but it does. I don't know if it makes me uncomfortable to be to be fully transparent. It makes me like, uh, that's for that's my joke. Like you know, just I I I want access to this material. It's mine. You know, you you leave it alone just because I want the material. I don't really, I don't know if I'm offended, but I just want it for myself. Mm, okay. Now, Laura, do these things. You know, right now we're in an age where, you know, comedians are always getting canceled or, or called out for something that they may have said 10 years ago that, you know, we can pull a clip on YouTube that you may have posted and sort of said, oh, my God, can, can you believe what Lara just said? Are you worried in this day and age with things that you're saying now about being canceled or about being called out? I try and be as offensive as possible in all moments of my life so that you just know off the bat <laughs> what to expect. So it, you know what I have found? The people who get called out the most are the people who um, who aren't super edgy or offensive and then something from their past gets trudged up and it's like, mm. oh, so-and-so? If you just are um, treacherous at all times, no one really cares what you do. So I'm not that worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have no, you have no limits. Can you make Holocaust jokes? Um, okay. I mean, in terms of Jewish material, I have zero limits because that, that's, as you said, my domain, my property, my identity. Like I, I feel like I can say and do whatever I want. Certainly with other identities that don't belong to me, I'm going to leave that alone. Not even because I'm worried about being offensive, but just because I'm not the best person to talk about that. 
you know? Can you can you give us your most offensive like Holocaust joke right now? Uh, I'm not going to get into the full joke and I actually don't even do it anymore, but I used to have a bit. It somehow it, I somehow segued into this idea that Hitler had a string of bad relationships with Jews, like Jewish men, and that's why the Holocaust started. And then there was something about him having side bangs and like getting <laughs> bangs because he had a bad breakup. Honest, honestly, it's been years, um, but it didn't. It wasn't resonating with people, so I stopped doing it. Anyhow, I don't really do a lot of Hitler Holocaust stuff anymore. I'll allude to it because, like, how can you not, as a Jew, allude to the Holocaust? I really don't. I'm probably like the one of the three of us who like. I really don't like Holocaust jokes, like especially when they come from non-Jews, like that bit in Mrs. Maisel when she does like that Hitler joke at a party. And I'm like, this is so inappropriate. And also like this show takes place so few years after the Holocaust, like no one would be making these jokes. And also like Mrs. Maisel, you're not actually Jewish. So like, please stop. I could get into the whole Mrs. Maisel not actually being Jewish subject for a long time. A long time. You laughed at my Holocaust joke though. Did I? Oh yeah. Come on. Don't you remember? (laughs) No. Okay, okay, Laura, <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? The Holocaust. The Holocaust who? You, you said you'd never forget. All right. It's not like a laughy. <laughs> it's like a, oh, I get it. Oh, it's David's sh- laughing. It's, sh- it's sticky. It's, it's sticky. sticky. It's sticky. It's sticky. It's sticky. Yeah. Okay, but but here's the thing. You know, when we talk about Holocaust jokes in Israel, they're, they're huge, right? Like anytime an Israeli misses the bus or anytime they stub their toe, do you know what they say? They say, Eze Shoah, which means, oh, what a Holocaust. Well, Israelis... Have a very different approach can to we, life. <laughs> uh, can we as North American Jews do that? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a whole other vibe out there. I mean, I also just think it's like personal preference. Um, it is certainly an uncomfortable subject and a, a dark subject. And if you're not comfortable joking about it or, or hearing jokes about it, that would be extremely reasonable. Extremely reasonable. It's just some kind of weird... Yeah. I don't know. I guess it's just like the inherited trauma thing. It like lives in my bones. And so I just... If I can just spew jokes about it mm. it feels a little bit it's like a release it's a release. release mechanism yeah 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 like purim right purim is the release valve for society right it's that one day every culture has this um as a day where you let, get to let go right it's mardi gras it's carnival it's uh i don't know i mean it's not really that's a made-up holiday cinco de mayo but let's be honest it's that kind of same sort of vibe um but cultures all have this as a way to like let go and i think that that happens in in humor as well that like you need this release to to make it work yeah so Laura, you have a new podcast coming out. Can you tell us about it? Sure. It's called Shticks and Giggles. Speaking of the shtick. Which is way better than the 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 other uh, alternate title for it, which would have been Lollocost. <laughs> I'm guessing, no. I actually wrote like three <laughs> lol puns. <I'm> here. <laughs> and somehow that never crossed my mind. And I'm disappointed in myself. It's, uh, it's me uh, talking to Jewish comedians about what it means to be a Jew, a comedian, and a Jewish comedian what the Jewish comedy identity is, if there is one, if there isn't one, uh, if, if Jews, if younger Jews, like, use their Judaism on stage a little bit less than, than older Jews, um, we'll, we'll have a theme every week, we'll chat around it, it'll just honestly be a lot of schmoozing, that's, that's the gist. Cool. And are, these are stand-up comedians or all different we're types gonna of keep comedians? it broad we're gonna keep it broad um stand up um sketch as my producer said potentially mimes so you know also oh. also a rejected title right keeping it broad with laura lebo keeping it broad with not, laura lebo a- <laughs> or mime talk which was just gonna be me and mimes uh but we scrapped that yeah i think uh you know i can picture that the mime responds the audience has no idea what they're gonna say it's perfect for a yeah, podcast it's just me platform. talking and describing uh, describing what's happening in front of me exactly excellent well laura i cannot wait um based on your previous podcasts um i imagine that these will be uh just as good if not better um and a lot of fun and i can't wait to hear the bits that you've selected for us uh, that are going to be uh, have already started and going to be continue to be scattered through uh the rest of this podcast Laura Lebo, thank you for joining us on Bonjour Chai and uh, come back anytime. Thank you. If you like this segment and uh, want to hear more Laura Lebo and other uh, great Jewish comedy, uh, stay tuned to the CJN for the premiere of Shticks and Giggles, Laura Lebo's new podcast uh, coming up very soon. And now, here's Juno-nominated comedian Nick Nemiroff. So I, I wrote another Hitler joke. <laughs> Hitler was also actually a, uh, a grammar Nazi. <laughs> he uh, 
killed my grammar. <laughs> and also... My grandpa. I will say I will say that joke feels dis disrespectful. But I know, I know. If my grandparents could see the smile on your guys' faces right now, they would do it all over again. <laughs> For the past three Purims, cannabis has been legal in Canada. But as our guests will likely tell you, cannabis has been part of Canadian Jewish life for far longer than that. And we wanted to get beyond the stereotypes of the Jewish summer camp stoner and explore the state of Jews and cannabis in Canada today. And so aiding us in this endeavor are Abby Roach, a cannapreneur, former owner of the Hotbox Lounge in Toronto and current senior manager for product initiatives for the Ontario Cannabis Store as well as Eden Walk and Lenny Kerman, co-founders of Oi Vapes, a cannabis vape brand that celebrates Jewish culture and inclusivity. Welcome all to Bonjour Chai. Shalom. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Abby, so uh, you've been in the industry for quite a while. Can you give us a brief history about how our people have been a part of the cannabis movement as activists and as consumers? Yeah, so I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in North York. I've been uh, smoking weed with uh, my Jewish friends since I was a young child. Um, you know, and growing up, there's and coming into, uh, you know, my activism and, and my entrepreneurship, there were so many Jewish uh, people and people that I grew up with that ended up in uh, in the community. Uh, there were doctors, Jewish doctors that were fighting for medical cannabis. There were Jewish activists. Um, you know, there were lots of Jewish business owners. Um, there's also Jewish politicians that really supported uh, what we were doing. And now that it's legal, those same people are still in the industry and are still moving the industry forward. You guys are clearly bringing your Jewish identity into this. How did you decide that Oi Vapes was going to be a distinctly Jewish brand and that you were going to bring your Jewishness into the cannabis space? Well, just to give you a little bit of backstory. So um, when I was living in Israel um, throughout university, um, I was bartending at the, the Ritz Carlton. And a really interesting experience for me was... Uh, over over Passover. So essentially, the Ritz Carlton in Israel, was, since we were part of the opening team, it was the first fully kosher Ritz in the world. Um, so you know, we had the kashrut going through the going through the hotel every day, all the time, um, you know, ended up becoming pretty good friends with them. But it was funny over Passover, the only spirit that we had for the our Ritz Carlton bar was Trump vodka, which obviously holds other implications now. But that was the only thing that folks could drink. So I, you know, it was, it was so frustrating for me. And it's funny, you know, you, you look at a lot of uh, the data that doesn't really exist on a certain market right now. That uh, doesn't necessarily mean that those folks aren't there. So I think a big thing for, for us when we wanted to create Oi Vapes is to create a brand that really speaks to, to Jews, but also it, it's something that's inclusive as well, too, and, and be able to, you know, ha promote and educate um, about our beautiful culture. What does that look like, weed that speaks to Jews? What does that entail? Well, it, well, it's so even even as far as the spirits, like we'll go back to, to the Ritz, like, you know, a lot of the companies, they could have, you know, had their, their brand on the bar, but they didn't necessarily go the extra mile to have all the certifications in place. So it's kind of just taking a, the guesswork for a lot of folks, because, you know, whether that's going back to the, the genetics of where we're sourcing the flour from, making sure the nutrients are all, you know, uh, passing the, the cash flow, all of the, all of the steps. It's just, you know, it's something that we're, you know, we're passionate about. We want to and check all those boxes and, and make sure that people don't have to, you know, second guess and, and, you know, and be able to, to launch, uh, maybe a not so popular gefilte fish strain for the, the, the masses, but something that would be novel and fun for, for a certain portion of the population as well too. Do you, do you see gefilte fish going off the shelves? I would be very down to Abby, try the gefilte fish <laughs> flying off the shelves at the OCS. Yeah, just to add on to what Dan was saying, um, you know, what the category manager for vape sent me over the deck and he's like, check this out. What do you think? 
And it really spoke to me right away. I was like, you know, like the marketing was hilarious. I was like, yeah, this is like totally Jewish. It's totally hilarious. I love it. From the shirts to like the, the name, um, you know, and then also the names of, of the genetics. So, you know, from a branding perspective, as somebody who looks at thousands of cannabis products on a daily basis, um, you know, I think from a branding perspective, they really kind of hit the nail on the head of uh, of speaking to a Jewish consumer just from, from that humor side of it as well and, and just that lighthearted uh, sort of Jewish humor that we all have. Now, I'm, I wanna, I'm curious, now cannabis has been pretty much used in sort of ancient Israel for rituals, for spiritual connection, and, and possibly even a way to connect with the divine. Have any of you found that marijuana aids you in finding any kind of deeper connection to your Jewish values at all? Uh, for, for, for me, it's not so much about, you know, connecting to my Jewish values, but it certainly allows me to to have a different perspective of things uh, in the world, which, which I think is itself uh, somewhat Jewish. You know, we're always talking about, you know, it, it's always it's one of the key tenets towards at least how I see Judaism when I was going to school was always about how we need to look at other people's perspectives of how they see us, you know, how we see the world and what have you. And I think that that was part of that creation of the brand aspect is that we recognize that the Jewish community is so well represented in the licensed producer and Canadian cannabis network at a corporate level. Yet we're not necessarily represented on the brand side of things. And, and, and we felt that being a little bit light, being a little bit more fun, we're, we're providing that different perspective to the rest of the community. So, so for me, it's not something that necessarily connects me to God but, or, or my, my traditional values, but it has been something that has allowed me to at least take a moment, take a beat, and, and look at other people's perspectives, uh, which I think is one of the major key tenets towards Judaism. Am I, am I safe in assuming, Abby, that there are not many other um, subcultures or communities that are deliberately like thinking about um, their community at, within and, and bringing this into the cannabis space? Like, are, are, there, are there Christian um, cannabis companies? Are there Italian communities that are like saying like we this is an Italian thing to be doing like what is it about Jews that feel the need to justify uh, our cannabis consumption with like deep Jewish values or however it is that we want to think about it I, I think that there's a lot of communities that are not represented within the cannabis brands that are out there and that's just because of the newness of the industry um, you know for it's a kind of a nascent legal industry where it's been around for a really long time so even if you look at, at BIPOC communities or, or the gay community like they're not really they don't really have their own brands either so I, I think you'll see over the next couple of years, the segmentation of, of cannabis brands really, really getting defined and refined as companies really start to look at the niches of their consumer bases, right? So whether it's a, it's a company geared towards Judaism or, or the gay community or, you know, whatever else not, it's important that companies really be able to refine their segmentation. Um, I think, uh, you know, I always say less is more in terms of uh, sure. product. But I mean, like, as, as, as Jews, something that I find is that we're always looking, right? And I don't see this necessarily outside in other communities. This is one of those things we're always looking to say, oh my God, yeah, but but my Judaism and my 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 weed use is totally the one and the same and it makes me more spiritual. I don't think that we I don't imagine that a lot of Christians are 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 infusing their Christianity with with their cannabis use or anything else. But there's something Jewish distinctly Jewish. And I'm sure you, you, you've, you've witnessed this, no? I think it's a sense of community as well. Like a lot of, of cannabis ritual is a sense of community and a sense of being with others that are alike. And I think the Jewish community has a lot in, you know, a lot of relationship to that, where we always look for, you know, our small community and people who are like us and we can relate to. So there's definitely a, a symbolism there. It's interesting. Uh, if I could follow up to that, I had a friend who, um, had a whole theory about why Jews are really into fish and into Bruce Springsteen and other bands that are specifically have these like huge fan bases. And I said, well, Jews are really uh, very communal by nature and they tend to go after bands that have these types of communities and where the concert feels like it's ritualized and it's communal because we speak the language of ritual and we speak the language of community in a very, um, you know, it's just ingrained in us. And so this really speaks very much. There's a strong parallel in that and that there is cannabis ritual and there is another community that we feel and you don't do it alone it's a, cannabis is not usually an alone drug it's more of a it's, it's more of a social social oh, and, yeah. and 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 kind of to, to echo what you're saying there abby you know for me personally um with my my cannabis use um it was 
tricky for me, especially going to university in Israel, half of my family is Israeli, I'm Israeli, um, but also to find that identity aspect because I find that cannabis has really helped me in that regard. Um, for a lot of folks, you know, wouldn't consider me Jewish because my mother's not Jewish. Wait, but no? as a, Get off the I show. absolutely <laughs> no. I'm totally kidding. Dead. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like hiding over here, hiding over. Here. <laughs> but um, but but it's it's funny. You know, it's interesting because a lot of my my closest friends from university um, in Israel, and you know, have bringing back that social aspect. You know, consuming cannabis together. A lot of my friends, even you know, people who were studying within Chabad, you know. Judaism is such a beautiful culture because it's an identity. It's, it's what you hold. And it's, and that's, you know, again, you know, trying to loop things in with whether that's with branding or anything, it's trying to create that community and, and, and open up a platform for education. You know, like this is something that's for folks like us, but also it's a, it's, it's an easy Avenue. It's a door that we can open for, to bring people in and explain to them. It's like, Oh, why is gefilte fish something that's interesting to you? You know, like that sounds disgusting, you know, but just to kind of have these avenues and these parallels here um, was something that's really important to us. And being from Israel yourself, I I'm sure you're aware of the stereotypes of, you know, after three years of serving in the military, a bunch of the Israelis go off to like Thailand or Cambodia, smoke a lot of mm -hmm. drugs, really try yeah. to reconnect. But what is what is the state of marijuana in the country Israel right now for people who are not familiar? Well, so so for me, I was actually I was born in Canada and I um, lived in, in in Israel for uh, through university, but half half my family there. But yeah, it's funny. Well, like, whilst I was at school there, like uh, that's honestly really where it opened my eyes to cannabis. There would be medical grows that were a, a block away from the university. Um, people, you know, recreationally, obviously it wasn't permitted, but medicinally, already back then, you know, over ten years ago people were taking um, cannabis medicinally. And it was just kind of, even if you were stopped on the street and you had cannabis, like it wasn't even a slap on the wrists compared to what we have here in Canada back then before legalization. So, you know, Israel has been always so far advanced medicinally. Um, even today with, with, uh, with medical studies, you know, a lot of like the big cannabis LPs, a lot of their, their studies are coming from Israel because they've just been doing it for, the, for longer. Um, and they have that much more funding that's geared towards that. Is Israel the place where people make a bore mine samim on their, uh, when they smoke? <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. I'll be the fifth. But I know Israel is very close to uh, decriminalization, legalization. Um, it went once through their, uh, through their parliament and it, it almost passed. And I think they're doing some revisions right now and uh, it should be tabled again from what I understand. So hopefully in the next couple of years you'll see uh real progression in israel yeah I, I don't know if you if you've seen in the news um there's uh, there's, there's a, this group of people that they uh, i don't know if there's a soft sponsorship with the grow up there but they have a drone that flies in tel aviv it's like every month or something like that and they'll just drop thousands of little grand baggies on it with like smiley faces in it <laughs> and i remember you know you'd be walking in the streets and people it was dangerous because people were like running in the middle of the streets to kind of collect all of these bags but this was happening you know 10 years ago it's, i feel like uh, that but... drone is going to be called the messiah is that, yeah, exactly. messiah has arrived from <laughs> classic <laughs> cannabis activism <laughs> So I'm getting yeah. the impression that it's more widely accepted, I guess, to be using cannabis in Israel. Is that right? I, I, yeah? I found it there. Yeah. I mean, um, especially, you know, whilst uh, in university, I thought it was even just talking to my family there and, and friends and uncles and aunts. You know, it was something that's been very normalized well before it was in Canada. Right. And so what's been your experience like comparing Canada to Israel? And this could be a question for Abby, too, because I you're you grew up in Israel, too. Right. Yeah, so what do you find there. the relation? Yeah. The the relationship in the Jewish community between Jews and, and cannabis. How is it different over in Canada? It's funny. I haven't been to Israel in six years. I think the last time I went was about six years ago. It was really hard to find weed, actually. And <laughs> that was uh, one of the big adventures of uh, calling my cousin and getting her to call her friends. And it was quite a big adventure to find uh, some, some hash down there, but uh, without a medical card. Um, but it, what's interesting here is that my parents, who are, you know, 70 and 75, respectively, um, you know, 
20 years ago when I opened my first shop, it was a huge thing that, that, you know, that I was in cannabis and I, and I smoked cannabis and oh my God. Right. And as the years progress and, and I started going on the news and, and being more public, um, all of a sudden my parents and friends all start coming out of the closet and they're all, <laughs> they're all pot smokers. So it's really funny how, you know, um, when they were uncomfortable with being open, you know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, all my parents and friends were on my parents' state of mind of like, you know, this is bad, this is drugs, it's bad. And then as the years progressed, their friends started coming out and as, as cannabis consumers. And then my mother actually changed her tune and don't say this to anyone, but she actually voted liberal uh, for Trudeau in order for it to become legalized so her daughter could legally uh, work. So... <laughs> So it was just uh, it was just like a funny um, a funny evolution, and I always said when I was an activist, it's like you know it, it, the twenty five percent of can Canadians that consume cannabis voting for cannabis legalization is is not a big thing, but when it's the rest of society, the people who don't consume, when they change their vote and start to agree, that's when the laws will progress. And now look at us three years later. Um, so hopefully, the Israeli society will also sort of coming out of the closet, as I like to call the grow closet will also change um, their political landscape and legalization will come there as well. I think Canada legalizing was a huge step uh, for the rest of the world. Absolutely. 100%. I think the legalization in Canada is, proves to be a pretty wonderful model for many, many countries. Um, and I think Israel, I hope Israel isn't, isn't far behind. What has changed over the past three years with legalization? I mean, I know that uh, I can see that stigma is a lot less, um, has, has been taken away to, to a great extent um, in the vast majority of the Jewish community. I, I, I was only able to speak about my community. So over the past few days, I've been asking a lot of uh, friends and colleagues from different uh, areas of the Jewish world, like what was like cannabis use like in their communities? And I'm hearing numbers very close to what the um, average would be for the average, like, you know, population in Canada in general. Um, somebody told me, yeah, you go to that synagogue, 20% of this of the people there are smoking. And and I said, but how many of them are talking about it? And he's like, you know, maybe, maybe 1% of that 20% are actually open and willing to talk about the fact that this is what they do um, and that it's just part of their lives. And he says, but there's so many more people that will go out and buy it and just use it and have a, a close circle of friends that they'll do it with or just with their partner or whatever it is. And, um, and I found that interesting that within the Orthodox community, there's still a lot of stigma attached um, to it. Um, and with me, maybe within the larger Jewish community. Um, although I'm hearing on the other side that, you know, you go to the progressive, really left spiritual communities, um, and there is much more cannabis use than even alcohol use. So, um, you know, what has happened? Like I said, it's a long preamble to that original question. What's happened in the past three years to change um, the way that Jews approach cannabis in Canada? I think legalization 100% help having something be legal. You're not breaking the law. So the stigmatization of, of being a criminal is is gone. Um, you know, you're legally purchasing your cannabis. You're walking into a store. You're paying with a credit card. Um, you know, you're speaking to someone openly about it. Um, it doesn't feel like, you know, it doesn't feel criminal. Um, and when you talk to somebody and they, you know, if, if they have a stigma about it, it's kind of their problem right now because, what you're doing is 100% legal. So it's not really uh, your fault for doing uh, what you enjoy. It's someone else's uh, problem that they are disagreeable with it. Um, so I think it's kind of turned the tables, you know, um, in, a, in a serious positive way for, for cannabis consumption, which allows people to, again, you know, just be more open about their cannabis cons consumption and not be, um, you know, not be ashamed of it and not feel like a criminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, um, as, as things progress too, you know, the, the more we have brands that kind of resonate with people, that'll really uh, help them open up into discovering their consumption, you know, within the first three years of legalization. And I'm sure Abby can attest to this, you know, you have a plethora of brands that are all screaming from the top of their lungs that we have the strongest weed, you know, like, uh, the highest DHC, like, you know, but it doesn't really, the brands don't, but that's not good marketing for Jews. No, right? no. If you go to Bathurst <laughs> and uh, Bathurst and Wilson, and you want to sell weed, you say, we have some pretty lightweight yeah, yeah. weed that might get you a little bit comfortable, but we don't want to get you too crazy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But people, that's the thing, right? Like no one, nobody can relate to that. So, you know, I think, and it's kind of like with every industry, you know, you say the same thing with alcohol, everything kind of needs to go that more boutique, tailored approach to who are you actually trying to appeal to? Because, and that's a, a common issue with all of these big companies, when you try to appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. 
So if you take the approach of, you know, having that target market and, you know, if, you know, and that's what we're trying to do with all the brands that we launch is, you know, do one thing and do it really well and stand behind that. You know, I don't want to go into a sushi restaurant and buy a pizza. Like that's just not, you know, I don't think or, that's or a pizza shop and buy yeah, sushi, exactly. which happens you've at clearly... every single kosher <laughs> yeah. restaurant. I was going to say, you've clearly <laughs> never been to any kosher yeah, yeah, restaurant yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we're really trying to, to create a, a platform for people to ask those questions. So, you know, it, and, and, and show them that it is OK to smoke or to bring a vape to Shabbat and ask Safta, hey, you want to like try this? It's OK. It's legal and have something for them that, you know, take out. I was totally thinking about this. <laughs> you know, we have this we have this conversation in the in the in the uh, CJN like channels of like talking like within. The, and, and I always want to talk about how oh, the, the bonjour high is, you know, it's not your bubby's CJN, <laughs> right? As in like, you know, we want to be younger and like show that we're, and it's bad branding to say not your bubby's this or whatever, but like there should be weed for your bubby. Yeah. Like, you know, that's light. That's like nice, a good entry level, like cannabis, right? Weed for your bubby. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, senior population really gravitates towards uh, like CBD oils and capsules right. and things that they're more comfortable with in terms of consumption. Um, you know, that, which is why edibles are seem you know, when people are, again, there's a big stigma about, about how you consume as well. Smoking is bad. Edibles are good. Capsules are good. Oils are good. Cause it's like medicine and food we do every day, but smoking is bad. So uh, there's a lot of stigma there that we have to break down as well. But the senior population really seems to gravitate uh, towards, you know, your CBD oils and and then they gradually add a little bit of THC because again, there's stigma about THC, whereas THC is bad because it gives you euphoria and CBD is good because it doesn't, which is totally false. You always need a little bit of THC mm -hmm. with your CBD, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of stigma within cannabis itself um, that was created by regulations almost um, and not being able to discuss openly. So again, I think once we we continue down the road of legalization and, and we can explain to people how cannabis works with your endocannabinoid system and on and on, um, all those stig stigmas will start to break down. But the senior population definitely seems more comfortable with, with what is... Um, a daily thing that they would usually do, like eat, drink, take a pill, pop an oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I don't know if David, you want to jump in or Alana, but uh, I, I'm only going to speak for myself, but I, I know that I never really smoked anything, cigarettes or anything else. And so it was hard for me to start if I was going to have cannabis as, as something mm -hmm. to smoke. And so it wasn't so much the stigma as much as it was, mm -hmm. you know, you know, 40 is not the time to start smoking and like getting into, like, you know, you know yeah. smoke and lungs and whatever. Uh, so mm -hmm. so I gravitated naturally towards oils and, and, and other things like that. There are no edibles in Quebec, uh, as you may or may not know, um, mm -hmm. unless you make them yourself. And uh, so that is, you know, where it's not so much always stigma attached, but it's, you know, why start that yeah. when there's so many other options available um, in that way? Absolutely. That's why in Alberta, we have the Alberta Advantage where edibles are totally legal and you can just go down to your private cannabis store anywhere you want. And that's what I've personally found is that I've never really, I've, I've smoked marijuana in my past, mm -hmm. but I've really enjoyed the edibles right yeah. now where... Um, I, it's even what my doctor recommended. My doctor, uh, I had a liver transplant. My doctor was saying, you know, avoid smoking it, avoid the inhalation. But if you want, consume the edibles itself. And yeah. I've had a very enjoyable time on that kind of path. Yeah, Absolutely. it's true. And there's so much great innovation happening in market right now. Vapes, you know, the innovations in vapes. Um, there's full spectrum edibles coming to market that really mimic um, the effects of smoking uh, through an edible. So again, legalization is only on year three. So I think you're going to see the legal market and the innovations and products and and who they speak to um, really, really change. So it's a really exciting time in cannabis and in, in legal cannabis around the world. Uh, we, we does not really appeal to me, um, but I have been surrounded by it. I went to theater school and that was basically just everyone always smoking all the time. <laughs> um, and then I lived in Vancouver for five years and I actually... 
I found it really funny because before it was even legal, everyone was so public about smoking. Like you would just see someone on their front porch smoking as if they were smoking a cigarette and like not Mm -hmm. even caring. A cop would see it and just not really say anything. So when it became legal, Vancouver did not change. It just there was just Mm -hmm. more storefronts but that were mostly already there. So I've definitely (laughs) seen seen the changes. But in in my research, there was – I was looking up Judaism and marijuana and like, what's the relationship? And there were some people that talked about, well, you know, as a people, we have all this PTSD and we have all this anxiety that we've inherited. And like, that could maybe be a a reason to explain why Jews have gravitated towards it. And it just kind of made me think like, I know that it's, it's a plant. It is natural, so to speak. But I'm like, is that like the way to deal with it instead of like doing the work to heal our trauma? But then I thought about like wine and ritual and how like we drink in so many of our holidays. And I was just Mm -hmm. curious to hear your thoughts on that element of cannabis use. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think especially with, with cannabis anyways, for me, some of the, the best moments I have is, is with whether it's sharing a, a joint or a little bit of hash with uh, some of my closest friends. And it, for me, cannabis really forces you to be introspective. Um, so, uh, you know, you really look within yourself, um, and, 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 you know, obviously it affects everybody differently and they use it for different reasons, but, uh, you know, I really, I, whenever I do consume, it's, it's, uh, a good, like in- introspective, thoughtful moment for myself to, to kind of mm-hmm. peer into. And it's funny, I'm the complete opposite. I don't drink alcohol, never have. When I go to family dinners, it's always like, they're always trying to push wine on me. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't drink wine, you know, like I, I just don't drink alcohol. Um, So it's interesting. Again, it goes back to, to my family opening up. My brother-in-law consumes, my sister uh, started consuming later on in life. Um, So it's interesting. The dynamics of my family have completely shifted from alcohol to, to cannabis cannabis we're sort of the majority now um in my family so that's kind of fun but um in terms of trauma i think you know again being introspective and and really thoughtful um you know and and opening up your channels of of feeling and and thinking um cannabis is very helpful for that um and it just you know for me is sort of that jewish trauma is really you know, away from cannabis, really discussing it with my family his, and, and their history and learning about my family's history and what happened to my family. We lost, I would say, probably the three quarters of our family tree was uh, erased, um, you know, in the Holocaust. So, um, you know, there's a lot of trauma there, but we need to deal with it on a, in an introspective level, but also speaking about it, being open about it. And uh, cannabis helps with that sometimes, too. One of the big motivators for me is uh, like my my father is, uh, you know, the most giving person I've ever met, you know, like everyone would always come. I feel like all my friends in high school would always come over to my house to hang out with Ori. Like that was just the thing because my dad would always cook and give people stuff. Um, And, you know, he has a lot of clients that he works in construction and he has a lot of clients and he would always grow his plants in the backyard and start making you know, his own little oils and cookies and stuff before, even before legalization, you know, and, and just having that, you know, bringing the whole atmosphere of, of giving and thoughtfulness and just kind of, you know, so he opened up so many people to be like, oh, wow, you know, you're in pain, like, don't go off on these prescription drugs, like try this instead, you know, maybe, you know, because he really does truly care about all these people. And um, that, you know, so that, that was a big motivator for me to get into the industry as well, too. I've always been passionate about it. And especially after leaving um, university, my, my partner and I started uh, the Great Canadian Hemp Company here before legalization. And that was like a vegan skincare company. And the amount of people coming to us and being like, hemp, like, is that legal? Like, you know, everyone, no, but no one knew. No one, no one knew what it was. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, you guys are you're high over there. It's like, oh, it's it's hemp, you know, it's the cousin me, but but it's just education, and that was really just trying to hammer that home. Is just people are really curious, and you know, we say, oh, look, cannabis isn't legal; it will be soon, but hemp is, and like hemp was used in building ropes. The Constitution is written on hemp paper, like all these things. You know, people just don't know. Um, So it all really, you know, boiling down to that having a platform for education. And, you know, just just seeing how giving like my dad was growing up with stuff like that and 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 allowing us to ask questions, both my parents giving us a platform to ask questions, you know, really made um, my transition into trying things at a young age very, very easy because we have that trust. And I think that is kind of an inherent, uh, you know, 
aspect to 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 Judaism as well too. You know, being able to openly converse and and bring those people together. And for our listeners who are, let's say, more novice or beginners and are interested in getting involved more with cannabis, what would you recommend? What advice would you offer to to learn a little bit more and, and then try something? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's so much great information, even, you know, OCS.ca, not to push my company's uh, work, you know, but we, we do put out a lot of really, really great beginner content just about, um, you know, what things are, what are oils, how they're made, you know, what it was craft cannabis on and on, um, how, how to, how to store something, how to consume it. Um, there's so much great information. Um, really when you go into the stores, talk to the bud tenders, uh, find out, you know, what product suits you, um, look up the products that you think would be good for you. Um, and just stay away from like what I like to call prohibitionist stigma. So, you know, anti-drug stuff, old, uh, old, old wives tales of, you know, it's a gateway drug, you know, all that is being debunked. And I think looking to, to new legal sources of information is really important and, and really sifting through the truth. Um, and I think for people who are afraid of sort of the criminal aspect, drugs are bad. Um, you know, I think looking into the history of the criminalization of cannabis, how it came to be, um, sort of the racial aspects of it um, will really be mind opening to realize that sometimes things are illegal, not because they're necessarily bad, quote unquote, but because there was other motives behind them. Um, so I think those are two really key things for new consumers to look at is the history and then the forward and the new products and how to use them, um, what would best suit them uh, for consumption. Maybe you don't want to smoke flour, maybe you want, you want to um, vape dry flour, maybe you want to vape a, a concentrate, right? Like uh, really find your, your niche and start slow and go from there. Don't eat 30 edibles at once. Don't finish a vape cart, you know, have one edible, have one puff, wait a few minutes, see how you feel and, uh, and go from there. So start slow and, uh, and grow to where you are comfortable and you're, you know, don't, you don't, you don't need to be a pot hero. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's the same advice the same advice I as a rabbi would give to anybody who's becoming more observant, right? Start slow. Don't look at the old information. Look at the new sources, right? Figure out your niche in the Jewish community mm -hmm. and go for it. Yeah, exactly. There you go. And I, I think, yeah, just what Abby was saying, ask, ask, don't be afraid to ask questions. Like go, you know, when you go into any retail location, you know, bud tenders are used to people asking questions. So, you know, just shoot, ask away the same thing as you would do if, if it's you going into a bar, you know, like what kind of cocktails for you? Everyone has a different palate. Everyone's endocannabinoid system is different. So really don't be afraid to, to ask questions. And like, you know, like they were saying, is, you know, yeah. start low and go slow. I got one last question, uh, probably more geared towards uh, Idan, but uh, Abby, you probably have some insight into this as well. Um, the more I, uh, we've been talking about this for the past half hour or so, um, the more I think that a wonderful marketing opportunity for Bonjour Chai would be to have our own branded strain of, um, you know, of, of cannabis. Um, how realistic is that? Uh, how do we go about making this happen? Idan, should we be talking about this offline? Is this, uh, um, do you think that we can get a frozen chosen strain on the shelves at some point in the near future? <laughs> Oh, I mean, I think if if, if we want to get a, a strain on the shelf, we should be chatting more with Abby on that one. But uh, no, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, no, no. We we love the idea of collaboration and uh, very very open to that. And I think we should definitely continue the conversation offline and see what we can do. Um, yeah, I mean, it'd it. be very fun. No, I like likewise. We would love yeah. that. And from a regulatory sure. perspective, just to go in there, is uh, all you really need is a, a licensed processor um, that can that has their sales amendment to sell into the provinces, and then from there you're good. Um, and uh, so anything, the world is your oyster. Just follow the regs, read C forty five, and uh, that's all you really need in life. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What's your favorite Jewish uh, cannabis pun? Quick. Like Ooh, the kosher kush, um, and everybody goes for the stuff uh, like that. Like, I, I like it's, it's it's almost time to get high. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, a bunch. Of them, yeah. <laughs> awesome. I actually really like their oi vapes. Uh, th their names for their um, for their vapes are awesome. I thought they were really great. I'm, I'm <laughs> super you. pumped yeah. to uh, to get a cart. I appreciate. 
I, you have no idea the pushback that I was getting when my partner and I, when we had proposed the gefilte fish <laughs> one, everyone's like, no one's going to buy that. I'm like, you don't know. I would. As long as it's got a little horseradish and a little carrot. I'm seeing David right now <laughs> saying to himself, gefilte fish vape with a little bit of yeah. horseradish vape and a little puff oh, on the side. Yeah, and a I carrot. I am down to try that. And a little carrots, <laughs> carrot vape on the top of that. Yeah, anyways. You yeah. just see it all laid out on the table during the seder. It's just. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Iran, Abby. This has been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Uh, happy Purim to all of you um, and uh, enjoy. All right. Thank you for having me. Ta-da. You can find links to whatever we talked about uh, in the show notes. And as always, we'd love to hear what you think. Email us at bonjour at the cjn.ca to let us know. Uh, so I was like, oh, fuck it. Like, I was just trying, I'll go single. And she set me up and I had to with all her like Jewish lawyer friends. I know that's a stereotype, but in this case, it's very apt, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and so I was sitting with them, trying to have this one night stand at also an Orthodox Jewish wedding. Like, I'm glad that Jews don't believe in hell, because if that were a Catholic wedding, it would be like, go straight to hell, do not have to go, do not have to go. Uh, that is like the worst. And so, and on top of that, uh, again, like not drinking, uh, but then. Also, Jewish weddings happen on a Sunday, so it's really hard to hook up on a Sunday night when you've got the whole work week ahead of you. Uh, I mean, for me as a comedian, not so much, because I didn't have a job the next day, but like for gainfully employed women who I'm trying to sleep with, you know, if they actually want to, you know, go to work and focus on their careers instead of hooking up with a broke comedian. Uh, <laughs> You just heard from Dan Rosen, a playwright, improviser, and comic from Toronto. Our word of wisdom this week comes from Rabbi Mark Fishman of Congregation Beth Tikva in Montreal, Quebec. He recorded this from the airport in Warsaw, Poland, where he and several other rabbis went to aid refugees leaving Ukraine. To hear the full interview, listen to our sister podcast and visit their page at the cjn.ca slash daily. Something which is so powerfully, if I can just, if I can just add something which is so powerfully um, a, a footnote to that comment is really the Jewish principle found in the Torah of not hating an Egyptian. If there would be any nation that the Jewish people would naturally harbor resentment and animosity towards, it would be the Egyptians. And the reason given, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Notwithstanding the brutality that we suffered at their hands, we were residents in their land. And I am struck by the fact that, yes, the brutality, and sometimes murderously so, that the Jewish community has suffered in Ukraine and in Poland, and yet it is the Jewish people, whether represented by on-the-ground aid organizations or extensions of Israeli NGOs, it is an incredible irony that can give hope in this darkness that it is us who have suffered so much persecution who are at the forefront of giving help and assistance. And now it's time the show where we list our nachas of the week, the things that make us feel good about being uh, Jewish and uh, and or Canadian uh, this past week. David, what's been your nachas? Okay, are you familiar at all with Roots Metal, you two? Yeah, I follow that account on Instagram. Roots Metal. No, I'm not. Roots Metal. She's pretty big on the gram. She posts like a lot of helpful information regarding Jewish life, Jewish politics. She posts a lot. She's been posting a lot about Ukraine and Jewish history and like very easy to follow captions. She's pretty wonderful. She put together uh, this compilation of fairy tales called The Witches of Eshkazoo and Other Jewish Fairy Tales. It's a very short read. I finished it in like one bath time sitting. You know, some of the, some of the fairy tales are from like that we'll be familiar with, like the golem and others that you may have heard of. She also makes jewelry too. Follow her on Instagram. But basically, I just want to shout out my nachas to her fairy tales, her book of the witches of Eshkazu. Cool. It was really wonderful to hear some stories that I had never heard before. Fun. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Alana, what's your nachas? Um, my nachas goes to my future sister-in-law. Hannah Sroor, who just started a new book review column at the CJN. So now uh, CJN is running in the fam. Uh, she put out her first article uh, where she reviewed All the Shining People by Kathy Friedman and I Am My Beloveds by Jonathan Papernick. And uh, word on the street is that she's been already getting unsolicited requests for book reviews. So it seems That's like it's a hit. When you start doing book reviews, you start getting galleys and just they start stacking up. 
Yeah. That's what happens. What about you, Avi? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not a big Nachas person about past events. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those, but that tends to not be my, my wheelhouse. But I did, an, uh, I did a really, really fun event last night. Um, and so, so that was my Nachas. It was, very, it was one of the highlights of the week, actually. Uh, actually. Um, it was an otherwise chock full week filled with like meetings and calls and podcasts and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I did a cocktail event for the State of Israel Bonds Rabbinic Advisory Council. Wow. Um, so I did a cocktail. So I taught cocktails to 40 plus rabbis. Um, and taught Torah with them. And I mean, this is like, you know, next level because I didn't have to just teach the basics. I got to teach, you know, rabbi puns and in-depth Torah learning about like pieces of Talmud about alcohol and wine and what it does to you and all that. Um, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, it's great to teach a group that appreciates, you know, like my humor, like, you know, our, our producer, Michael, right, for one, <laughs> who just <laughs> will always you like... You made him laugh a lot mouth. today, though, at your <laughs> intro. I'll I don't do think I you were looking at the screen, but he was laughing and a lot of thumbs up. So okay, well, you did good. It only took one year and one extra episode. Maybe it's because I gained my like comedy legs last night with <laughs> yeah. all of the rabbi humor, you know, talking about like... Hillel, the the mixologist who was asked, teach me all of cocktail, you know, all there is to know about cocktails on one foot. And then he went and said, spirits, sugar, water, bitters, and all the rest is commentary. <laughs> Did you teach about Judaism and its influences with marijuana at all? Uh, no, because that was uh, not the topic. I was making cocktails, and uh, it was not a cannabis. <laughs> David's, uh, like, uh, really <laughs> pushing today. He's like, oh, you need to sing Ragadia at your workshop that has nothing to do with the singing, and then you need to teach. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I hear what I want to hear, okay? And I, I give up my suggestions. They may be rejected by you, but I think I think there is a place for these things, Alana, at your Seder. And marijuana with Abby. Cocktails with rabbis, always a fun time. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending March 12th, Shabbat Vayikra and Shabbat Zachor. Our producer is Michael Freeman, who, by the way, is also a stand-up comedian in his own right and has promised us a bit at the end of the credits. Our technical producer is Andre Goulet. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. I'm Avi Feingold. I'm Ilana Zakon. And I'm David Sklar. I was raised under, uh, under the old Judaic maxim of uh, whatever doesn't kill you is probably still anti-Semitic. Uh, my father is extremely paranoid as a Jewish man. He blames everything that is wrong in his life on an anti-Israeli conspiracy, including me. I went to see Domas with the Zohan last summer. The projector broke down. He started screaming about Arabs. He sent me to a, my parents sent me to a strictly Zionist elementary school where if you so much as mention Christianity, they make you sit inside during recess and listen to klezmer folk music for half an hour. I, uh, I hated everything about that school. The teachers were the absolute worst. There was one teacher who taught history and phys ed, like combining the two. So in gym class, he made us build pyramids and chant. 